thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation, and I'm very pleased to be part of this and series on data citation, which has already produced some, some wonderful presentations and, and some great web content as well. So uh, very nice to be to be added to that portfolio. So I'm going to spend a little time at the beginning just explaining about the Data Archive and its collection to give you a little bit of an overview, and then I'll move into talking about the data citation methodology that we've chosen and implemented at, at the Data Archive. Okay, so uh, based at the University of Essex for quite a long time now, over 40 years, and spent selecting, ingesting, dealing with a variety of social science data sources, and I'll explain a little bit about where they come from in a minute. So we've been designated by our National Archives as a place of deposit, which means we can hold public records. And a lot of the data that we bring in and the support services that we provide support um, higher, and, higher and further education, research, learning and teaching. So we kind of really can support any data user, but our, our primary target audience is higher and further education. Although that um, includes also many other researchers who are who wanting to use social science data. And more recently, last year, we went through a a long process that enabled us to uh, to gain the information security standard ISO 27001, which means we can hold disclosive data. Um, and that was a, a lot of auditing and a lot of work, um, but it, it means we're, we're a trusted digital repository in that sense. Excuse me for the, the slow action. <laughs> right, so just a little picture of where we are so you get a flavor. We have got a very nice green campus. With buildings that were, were built in the 1960s, and some of the towers you can see, they're actually listed buildings. They're, they're ugly, but they're listed. But um, our campus is, is based on an it Italian village called San Gimignano. It just doesn't quite look Italian or medieval, but it's a nice place to be. And we have a brand new building that was uh, built about three years ago, uh, dedicated for, for the Data Archive and for the Social Research Centre that conducts our panel studies in the UK. And, and that's our nice building on the right there. So. And just give you a flavour of what, what we look like. So uh, just to say, this, this is the Data Archive. Uh, this is the Data Archive website. Um, this is our Data Archive website. Uh, you can go and have an explore of that later. And um, this particular diagram says that we're, we're part of a bigger international federation of social science data archives around the world. One in Australia, sitting down there in Canberra and one in uh, America who we work closely with at the University of Michigan. So most of the Western Europe do have these data archives and we're part of this bigger bigger international network. And we work very closely together on metadata standards, solutions, training materials, those kinds of things. So we have a family of services. We were running a number of different services you can see listed in grey on the left. From October the 1st, we have a brand new grant, a five-year grant, uh, called the UK Data Service that brings all of these data services together under one roof. And uh, we're currently being rebranded, so we don't know quite what our identity looks like at the moment, but it will wrap in all of these support services that support all kinds of social science data in, in the UK. And uh, we have a number of uh, research and development projects, some on metadata, some on repository systems, um, on, on many different things, actually. Some on, on providing access to, to, to geodata. Others are about preservation and preservation standards. But we do bring in quite a lot of grants to, to do kind of forward-looking uh, research. We have, as an organization, uh, more recently in the last year, adopted the OAS functional model which means that our whole uh, our divisions are based around these particular sections of ingest, data management, storage, security, access, preservation. So uh, as an organization, we follow, follow this model. We have sli two slightly different adaptations in that we have a, a, a sort of area of, of descriptive information here. We have an area that says, um, that's supposed to say pre-ingest uh, there. So um, we, we have an area of kind of metadata um, on its own that sits as a um, a department and, and we have a, an access and data support unit um, and a lot of work goes on there to provide um, a su support and access to users but it's nice to follow a, a functional model and it seems to work very well so where do our data come from um, a lot of it comes from central government agencies like office of national statistics like the home office like the department of health and they give us um, important government series and some of them are dating back to 1960 for example the what was called the Family Expenditure Survey, um, combined with, with a food survey from the 1960s. We, we have got a series of data going all the way back to the 1960s, so it's very important um, and time series collection. 
We uh, provide access to statistical time series, some of the macro data banks from uh, international government organizations like the World Bank and IMF. Um, we do gain grants, um, grant data that comes from research projects uh, when an academic is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. As part of their grant, they have to offer data. So there's a stream of research data coming in, which can be anything from surveys to qualitative data, um, sets of interviews, psychology experiments, um, many kinds of, of, of very vast, um, vastly different data sources actually. Uh, we collect data from market research agencies, polls, do have some historical sources, uh, historical databases and records going back to the, the 14th century. And of course we, we do facilitate access to data in all the other data archives around Europe. So if somebody wants data from Finland, we can help them acquire that. And just give you a picture of what we do. It's about 6,000 collections, uh, 6,000 data sets in our whole collection. We add about 2.30 a year, uh, we've got about 20,000 or so registered, active registered users and uh, probably download something like 60,000 data sets a year. We have a lot of uh, activity in our users for unit. So that's the kind of um, size, that, size that we're looking at. Uh, we've also on the other side done quite a lot to try and promote uh, use of our data. So we've got a whole website here that tells you about what people are doing with data. And they're kind of short one page descriptions on what data you used and what you did with them. And, uh, I think there's about something like a um, hundred in there at the moment, and they they span between the purple ones of research and the blue ones of teaching. So they're a nice they're a nice promotional tool to, to, for producers and for users to see kind of what's happening. So you can go again explore some of those if you want to get a flavour of what people are doing. So uh, back to but back to the topic of data citation. Um, for many years, as part of our end user agreement for actually accessing uh, data through through our online system. You have to acknowledge um, the original source, and there's a statement there which is part of the end user agreement number nine that says you'll acknowledge in any publication uh, the original data creators. Now that is a contractual agreement and people are supposed to do that, but it's very hard to enforce because um, or even though we provide a, a, a method of citation, people don't necessarily do it that well, um, particularly when the titles of, of the data sets are complicated. And um, so just to show you there, we give, we've, we've always given information, um, citation information as, as a separate file which tells you that you have to cite the data like this. So we've always had a way of doing that, actually even from the 70s, quite early on. Um, but of course, this is different from an acknowledgement. It is a citation um, and an acknowledgement, many people are using those. They're not adequate, as we know, for, for citing data. And uh, this is why we've moved to a more robust system of citation. So. You all know why we should cite data. I'm sure you've seen some of the wonderful presentations from beforehand, but it, it's about acknowledging the, the author's creativity and sources and, 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 and identity as well. Helps you find data, helps promote reproduction of research so you can get back to original results and, and, and play with them. It, um, it allows the impact of data to be tracked. We now know that if you put a, a DOI into, into Google, you can just immediately kind of get some, some uh, idea of what's happening to the data. And it provides a, a, a good structure, which, which I think uh, data creators will feel that, they, that, that there's more incentive to, to deposit data now that there's more of a kind of reward structure. Um, so there's lots of positive things. Um, so our wish to use persistent identifiers was going back some time, and uh, you know we, we wanted to use them. And for us, you know, we've already got URLs, we've already got citation. We wanted something a bit more permanent uh, and unique. And um, our, our the definition of digital objects was the thing that took us longest to kind of uh, decide what exactly what we wanted to do. But it should it should be very clear what the granularity is. Um, and also, as we know, there's a lot of identifiers being um, being applied to many different things. And uh, as you probably know, if you haven't, you can go and get an ORCID ID already, which gives you a unique ID for yourself as a, as a researcher or somebody as part of the institution. So the, this idea of permanent identifiers is, is very important across our whole community particularly for, for long-term data providers. So um, our data collections are not actually digital objects, they're collections of uh, a sets of materials. So one of our collections could have you know, 100 files in it or it could have one file. Um, it, it's a, co a collection of materials that make up one particular uh, study. And that's important for us. Our unit of, um, of description is, a, is a, a research study or a particular survey that was done. So uh, we want to capture changes made to data and um, we do already version data, but we wanted to make sure it was commonly understood we had a ro robust way of versioning our data. 
and uh, we wanted to think about what a significant change to data might be. And that's very important for us. And we wanted to use highly structured data so that machines could, could understand um, what we were doing. So um, our other kind of requirements were that our, our current digital preservation activities, this particular flow fitted in with that. And um, because there's a lot of investment in, in planning this, we wanted to get it right the first time rather than have to go back and start a different system. So lots, lots of things to think about at the time of planning. So just to, um, to kind of iterate there, about 15% of our collections do have some kind of change in the first year, which is a bit of a pain really, but we often get issued new data sets, new variables, uh, particularly new variables, they've, they've upgraded a variable, they've derived something different, they've replaced it, so there's quite a lot of changes which, uh, which we issue as new additions. Um, and it's not always clear, you know, which, which edition you're working with, so we wanted a more robust way of, of, of kind of signalling those changes. And an example is if you're on a, a series, a longitudinal study, you're collecting data every year, every time you add a new wave, it, it creates a new addition because you add that particular wave to, to, the, to the existing years of data that you've had. Regrossing is sort of balancing estimates so they fit in with current population um, uh, trends, current population uh, statistics, and, and sometimes we do that to data. And also there can be changes to documentation, new parts added, bits that were missing. So there are these ongoing changes. Um, which means we have to reissue data. So um, versioning is very important for us. So we one of the important things, sorry, let's go back. One of the important things is we want to distinguish between what is a major change and what's a minor change. That's been the most, most important thing for us. Because some of these have much larger impact than other changes to data. And we wanted to try and make sure we're not versioning every single change that happens, because that would be difficult to keep, to keep track of. And actually, on the whole, although there's a lot of talk about verification and replication of data, in our field, we've mostly seen people wanting uh, new data for new research to ask new questions of data. And um, so that, that at the moment, we, we do just make current versions available. Uh, early versions can be accessed, um, but not from the website. You have to come and ask for them. But that's something we need to, to think about and are is how we make previous versions available, but sometimes there could be 20 different versions and editions of, of one data set, so you can see the problem, and most people really do want the most accurate, up-to-date one. So, just trying to define a little bit for you what we mean by low and high impact. Just an example of low impact there is somebody just might simply add a reference to, to, a ref to the bibliography. They may have made spelling mistakes, um, you know, that, that can happen quite a lot, but sometimes we get um, variables supplied that are, shouldn't be in there, accidentally supplied. Um, sometimes there's minor changes in document documentation that are not going to affect the content or the way that you use the data. Sometimes we add new terms. We do index all our data using a thesaurus, a social science thesaurus. Sometimes, you know, terms change, they get updated, new terms get added, so we do re-index sometimes. Um, and then sometimes we add little extra bits of documentation because they've, they've come about and sometimes there's a change in access condition if you're changing from maybe data under, under public license to, to a, a more um, restricted license. So that there can be changes in all those kinds of things to, to think about. And then in terms of high impact, that would be something that's really going to affect the content and usability of the data set. And that will be if you've added a new variable, that will be important to know. Um, we might have new uh, new value codes, so somebody might have actually um, changed the way in which they're, they're giving the, the different options for the data. Instead of a, a, a yes, no, you could have had a yes, no, um, I really don't know. That could have been added as a as another code. So some, sometimes that does happen. Um, sometimes the weighting variables that help you kind of balance a, a data set have been, have been changed. The statisticians who, who own a government survey might have done a lot of work afterwards and these changes are not available till, till they've actually given us data. Um, changes in formats, yes, that doesn't happen very often, but it, it could happen. There could be, well, I mean, it, there could be file migration up, up to a new version of data, and that could signal quite a big change for people. So they're the kinds of things that we, we want to distinguish between, and, and that's very particular to our, our sorts of data. But some of those have relevance to, to other kinds, you know, scientific data, other kinds of data about what's really important and what's not so important for you to think about. So um, the next step is trying to find an instance of, uh, of a change collection. What is this collection and how is it changing? So um, we do make various changes to data and uh, they, they might be internal changes that, that happen at the, at the point of ingesting data and we don't particularly release those changes. 
which would for us be something that changes internally but not, not externally. What's more like to happen is there's low impact changes where we release the change um, and we have a, um, a, a new external instance that's got the same um, identifier because it's not important enough to change it. <coughs> we have a high impact change where we release a new data set and we decide that it, it's, it's worth having a new um, identifier and I'll show you what these identifiers mean and, and how they change. So uh, we started working with um, data site and we worked with the British Library data site who are one of the agents for, for assigning um, DOIs. In 2011 our, um, our director Matthew Woolard has been very involved in, in, in this, this whole area for some time um, and I, as you probably know data site has been founded for some time. It, it established its own format for citing data and it works quite closely with data publishers to try and sort of promote the idea of data citation. So not only does it provide a methodology and issues DOIs, also doing quite a lot of advocacy in this area. So, um, what's a DOI? I'm sure most of you do know, but it's about persistent identifica identification of, of objects, of digital objects. String of letters and numbers, nothing, nothing that complicated, a systematic string of letters and numbers. And um, subscribers who, who want to, to get DOIs basically join um, data sites and they get access to uh, to DOIs that they, they can get you know once they've once they've got a contract and then these um, these particular records end up in the, the, their metadata store and resolver system and there seems to be I'm not sure how many last count I think in May there was about 1.3 million objects in there there's probably a lot more now and of course there's other handling systems out there but we've actually chosen to go with a data site because we work very closely with our British Library on, on many other areas. So, um, how are they created? So, um, as a data publisher, which is what we are, we register and obtain DOIs, we mint them, we have a system for doing that with our own infrastructure uh, for dealing with metadata, and we use the API to, to, to get the DOIs, and it's actually a fairly straightforward process. I'm not going to go too much into the technical side today. But, um, so think about what do you want to allocate your DOI to, it's got to be allocated to some kind of object or something, something that's got an identity. We actually use um, our core metadata as the the the, um, the thing that relates to the data collection. So you think, okay, core metadata title. This is the name of a particular study. That should be quite straightforward. It's not always straightforward because sometimes the titles of the studies change, which one might not expect. But um, it may be that, that that one of the government departments decides it's it's changing the name completely, and we need to somehow reflect that change. So our solution is that we have. Um, Metadata is the is the um, the object that our DOI um, identifies, and that's a, an external instance. So it's representation of one of our data collections at a particular particular point in time. So when you get a DOI and you type it in somewhere, it, it resolves to a jump page, <coughs> which actually lists all the history of the changes to the data set, and then that then points. Um, to the, the catalog record where you can go and get data. So there's a kind of front page that gives you the, the change, the, the change log. <laughs> and as I said before, um, high impact changes denote a new DOI. So showing you what this looks like, um, for example here, this is a DOI on the left, I'll, I'll show you the structure of what ours look like. And hypothetically, it, it's a study number SN, study number 2000, version 1. This denotes a study number that's got this is a survey that's been continued over 13 years. It's got waves 1 to 13. And this is an instance specific data set. So it's, it's fixed in one point in time and it has its own um, accompanying metadata. The next step would be um, we've actually made a change. As you can see that the blue box in the middle, we've added another wave. So that means we've changed our DOI. So it's a slash 02 now. And again, this is instance specific data. It's actually a different data set. It's changed uh, and it's got a, a different metadata record. And then finally there, we've added another wave, wave 15, um, it, it's changed, the DOI has now changed, it's an 03, instance specific metadata. When you go to our jump page, you will see that, that history, but you will be taken to the most recent version of data, because at the moment that's what our data want, uh, that's what our users want. They, we don't give them instant access to some of the older waves 1 to 13, because actually, for our kind of data, waves 1 to 13 is already available in waves 1 to 15, so you can still get at that particular data set. Uh, but it's something that, that we want to think about, about how we do provide access to, to previous, um, previous versions. Right, so this is an example of our jump page, if you go to one, if I plugged in this DOI that's 10.525 slash there, 
I would get um, a little page that gives me a kind of potted history of what's going on. So it, it has the most recent uh, DOI change data set version at the top, Python 3. It gives me the citation and the change log. So it actually gives you a very short uh, human description of what happened. So in February 2012, um, we, uh, for the third edition, we added in um, wave two of the study. So you can instantly see the changes as you move down. You can see what the older data sets were. So it's quite a simple way of, of defining change and telling people what, what the versions are, are doing. And then uh, in terms of the way that we create an update DOIs, um, we will create, well, when we create a new catalog record, so when we've got a new data set and we're ready to publish that, we mint a brand new DOI through data sites, we update that change log and we create a new citation file because the citation's actually changed. Um, we have something that's part of our documentation called a, a, a citation file, which people can download, and it, and it gives you the way of citing data. Um, also, if we update a catalog record by, you know, implementing various changes, we decide whether they're high or low impact changes. We create uh, or update a new DOI if there's a high impact change. We update the log and create a new citation file. So there's that process about bringing in new data sets and updating all the ones. So here's our format. As you can see, this is a kind of constructed DOI that, that, that very similar to what other people are using. You've got your own identifying organization um, identifier, for, which for us is 10.5, 2 by 5. We've got our readable identifier, which is UKDA. SN is what we use for study numbers. All our collections are called SN, study number 1, 2, 3, 4. And the resource identifier tells you what, what the actual data set is. Um, you know, they go up to 6,000 at the moment. We've issued about 6,000 of these things for our collections. And the resource version is what I was talking about, something that is the, the current version, and that will change, that will increment every time we have, have this high impact change. So on the left there at the bottom, high impact change means you get a, just simply just go from one to two. So it's quite straightforward. With a low impact change, we don't change the, the version, but, uh, but internally we're keeping track of what's happening so that we know what's a minor version. So we know that there's been a change, but it's not denoted externally. And just an example here of when we have a, a DOI, if I plug in the DOI at the top in, in the, in the um, data site um, metadata registry or search interface, it will give me um, a link to the data set. Um, and then if I click on that, the bottom screen uh, tells me where the landing page is. So I can actually go and resolve to, to the jump page of the data archive. And it gives me the citation there. Now we, um, there's a standard way of citing with, with, um, with data site where you send up five fields and this is what's displayed. But actually for us, this doesn't display version and it's very important for us. So we're, we're actually changing the way, um, we're adding another field to, to the data site, um, the metadata we send up because that's important that that particular version is reflected in, the, in these fields. So the five core kernel fields that are used are not, not exactly appropriate for our kind of data. So we need to add in resource type and, um, and version and we're currently doing that now. Every, I guess, collection is going to have slightly different requirements and maybe versions are not always as, as important. So if you put the DOI into Google, um, you can immediately track what's happening to data so you can get a good idea of who's, who's actually citing that data and that's a nice, simple way for us to try and find out who's using our materials. In the past, it's been very hard. We've been able to put sort of keywords like um, health server for England into various Thomson Reuters indices to see who's using things, but it's a very manual way of of finding out who's, who's, uh, who's using data. So we're hoping we can help track the impact of some of these data sets. And also, of course, identify the people, go to them and say, would you like to give us a case study? And then add that reference to our metadata, which we, we actually um, keep a list of secondary analysis publications for, for users. So it enables us to, to really add value to our catalog records and to tell users, um, creators and users, what's happening. So uh, we're very pleased that that seems to work very well. <clears throat> so just thinking about linking in different resources um, by, by metadata, at the bottom there, ideally what we would like um, is some discovery portal that enables you to find data wherever it is. We don't currently have that in the UK, but there's various registries and kind of Uber portals that are working towards those things. So um, you can see th at the top box on the right, especially data repository, that's what we are. Um, in the middle, there's a research council outputs repository. Um, for us, uh, there's something called a research output system where anyone who has a grant 
they have a, a web page relating to their grant and then all of their outputs have to be uploaded to this system. So you're going to find that all of the, the publications and outputs go in there. Also, uh, there's a demand now by all our institutional repositories that um, if you publish, you need to put you know, your latest version of, of your publication into that repository. We're seeing a lot more digital objects um, happening now, um, more systematically, and, and some of these, these repositories are demanding that, that, the, um, that the materials go in there. So it's a way of you know, tying these up in metadata stores so that we can begin to, to uh, more easily link um, articles and data together. And that's still a little bit clunky at the moment, but we're hoping in time that will happen. And um, we're very impressed with the ANS um, research portal. That's a fantastic uh, model to follow. Really, really, very, very good. So very jealous of you, Brian. So uh, we've also been doing quite a lot of awareness raising because now we had our DOIs, it was a good idea to go out there and say, look, hey guys, you need to cite data properly. So we applied for some money to our research council and we had just a small grant for four months to just do some advocacy really. So we produced a brochure with them about why you should cite data and this was aimed at social science researchers, that was quite widely disseminated. We also spoke to professional organisations in the social science and humanities domain we contacted every academic publisher and editor in of the journals in our domain and have done some outreach work with, with postgraduates and just talked about why you need to cite data and how to and why it's important. Um, so yes, I mean even some of the communications with uh, academic publishers have been quite encouraging that they started to include some citations from some of the, the smaller journals in, in their guidance. And, and already, you know, there's been quite a lot of pressure from other communities. I, I think we're starting more and more to see. Um, robust ways of, of citing data given by some of the um, some of the uh, academic publishers and, and, and journals, which is very important. We've done some events with the British Library Data Site on metadata and with the GISC, who here work a lot to look at uh, sort of building repository infrastructures. And of course, metadata is absolutely critical for enabling the sharing of these. Um, and we have things called doctoral training centres in the social sciences, where um, universities are given a particular uh, a kind of particular specialist centre to train in various areas of social science, so they they provide expert advanced training, and they're useful because a lot of postgraduates doing sort of high-end research PhDs are a useful, you know, new young audience to to approach. So um, it's important to get to them as well because they'll be the next generation who are publishing. So it's been a really really nice short successful project we think, um, in combination with the British Library, and we produced uh, and and actually. More importantly, sponsored by the, the Research Council and actually the, the brochure produced by them, so endorsed, fully endorsed by them. So, uh, a brochure has been you know, used and it, it's very simple. It has to be very simple. It doesn't talk about any of the, the technical issues, but it, it talks about you know, why you need to do this. And um, you know, I know our sister archive in, in ICPSR in, in Michigan are doing a very similar thing. They, they have quite an advocacy program at the moment. So, um, so our DOIs, uh, you've probably recently seen the data citation index that's been released and uh, we're very pleased to have been included in, in that particular um, system. I think 20 repositories have been indexed. That's going to be starting up a part of the web of knowledge. I think it, it could be quite a big draw actually this one. Apparently there's about two records in there, there are two million records in there. And uh, they're also doing advocacy work which is going to actually go quite a long way, I think, in um, promoting scholarly, scholarly um, sort of communication and citation. So I, I think that's a, a real added bonus that's been taken seriously at that level. Um, and I know Heather um, referred to this this last week, which is an example there of data citation index um, and what it all looked like. It'll pull up metadata records and, and show you what the collections look like. So I'm not sure how it's going to work because I don't think it's live yet. I couldn't find a live site, but um, it, it looks sort of quite exciting really. So what are our challenges in the future? We seem to have sorted out our data citation methodology. It seems to be quite robust. We haven't encountered any problems yet, um, apart from needing to change the way that, that the data site displayed some of our uh, citations. Um, we need to be thinking about parts of data rather than whole collections. And what does that mean to, to cite and have permanent identifiers for single files? For example, subsets of data, uh, if you're getting data from an online system, and we have an online data browsing system called Nestar that allows you to, to browse and visualize survey data and create tabulations online. When you subset data or download it, how do, how do you provide a, a permanent reference for that particular part of data? 
and extracts of textual data if you're looking at qualitative data, interview data, and you want to use an extract. I'm very keen on having a permanent identification of that particular extract, and that's the next challenge for us that we will be looking at in the next sort of six months, actually. Um, also thinking about creating better relationships between outputs, data and outputs, um, and also making sure that we're linking funding information to uh, grant outputs and, and research outputs. So there's quite a lot to do, quite a lot to do in terms of sort of linking and connecting and um, more more powerful granular citation. And I know there's other um, data centres in the UK um, that are also looking at, the, at this kind of issue. So they're kind of some of the, some of the challenges that we, we want to be working on. And that really is um, an overview of what we're doing. And I'm certainly happy to ask questions. Um, on, on any on any any particular issue to provide clarification or show you more things on the website. So um, I, I hope that was useful.